What's up, y'all? Welcome back to the WYL Take Ownership Podcast, where we're all about taking ownership of your mental, your economics, and your community. I'm joined here today by Latoya Benjamin, who is a social entrepreneur who sits right at the intersection of public and private policy. So welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. <laughs> and I got Sydney Michelle Doyan. I said it right? You did say it. Awesome, right? <laughs> awesome. Journalist and media maven. I think you've worked everywhere. It's been really dope to watch as well. So welcome to the show. Thanks. So today we got some dope topics for y'all. We're going to start it off by talking about Malcolm X and the new documentary that just came out on Netflix, just getting a vibe from how everybody feels, as well as hitting you guys with what our thoughts are on the Zaya situation with Dwayne Wade, Gabrielle Union, how they've handled it, how she's handling it herself. Um, and then, of course, we'll, we'll talk politics today, actually, and get into the crux of what's going on in the 2020 election season and campaigning. How's that sound to y'all? Sounds good. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So I, I got to first start by asking, have any of you saw the new Malcolm X documentary, Who Killed Malcolm X? I did. I saw mm -hmm. first, I think, like three episodes. Yeah. yeah. What's What's been your biggest takeaway so far? Um, I think just how real it is. They kind of like dive into the details of who killed him. And it's crazy because, um, you know, I was born in Brooklyn, but I grew up in Jersey. And I have friends that are from the Newark, New Jersey area, and they tell me all the time that the guy who killed him or who they say killed him literally walks around in Newark to this day. Like, yeah. they all they all know who he is. So I just thought that was crazy, um, just how, like, real it is, even, you know, in our generation when, you know, he wasn't really part of our generation, but his impact definitely is. Mm -hmm. um, and just to think, like, his killer... Um, that's still walking around well, just were, on the were, streets were today. Were your friends just talking about that before this came out or now like post? They're like, talking like, about it post because I think right, okay. really no one, you know, they knew the name, but they didn't know the face. Right. Um. So now that, you know, they interviewed him on the series so now everybody knows who he is. And my friend literally just was texting me like, yo, I just seen him on Mad Max Billboard and, yeah. you know, with his, with his beanie and just chilling and, and talking to the old heads. So I just think that kind of like brought it home for mm. our generation because it's like this didn't happen too long ago. To yeah. be real. Like, so I don't want to like it's weird because it's real life. So it's not like ruining the story. But like, I don't I, I can hold withhold the thoughts at the end if you guys like. But it is it's interesting. Yes. Like the idea that he's been walking around this whole time. There's a, a crew of them. Unfortunately, the, the others died in the time since. Um but yeah, I mean, what are your what are your thoughts going into it? Have you seen it yet? You... I, I did. I think I, I got up to like the third episode, but I was really alarmed uh, yeah. because like just I watched the movie with, of course, Denzel Washington and I read the autobiography and none of that was like really exposed in either the movie or the book. So it was just like just the fact that, that he was such um, he was so he was so influential for our culture. And I think what was happening in the 60s is kind of similar to what's the political culture is happening now. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was interesting that they highlighted that. But the fact that it, there was no attention paid to actually solving the case is like, wow. And then he's like digging up the records and his public information mm -hmm. is just like, wow, why do we take so long to kind of get to the bottom of it? Mm -hmm. but, I, but I think it's it's a. Um so uh, we were talking offline a little bit about this concept and, you know, when you watch it, you see that the, the FBI had been actively tapping the Nation of Islam for a long time, right? So they were very aware as to everything that was going on, things that were being said, not being said, innuendos about killing Malcolm X. So the fact that they didn't highlight there was only a couple officers on duty that day, you know what I mean, in Harlem, the fact that the response was so lackadaisical and chill. Um, the fact that, like you mentioned, the the and I'm pointing that France off screen here, but like the podium was just chilling downstairs all these years. That yeah. was shot up. It wasn't even taken in as evidence. Yeah, exactly. People were walking all over the crime scene. Like that, there was it was it was supposed to happen, right? Um, and I think that's the part where I saw somebody tweet out like um, they were like, "The FBI killed Malcolm X." There's it, there's it all. I saved you six hours of your life. And his point was just basically being like. They by them not being proactive in stopping what was happening, you know, they were obviously complicit in him dying. Right. Um, Elijah Muhammad, right? What I mean, what it, he he nothing moved without at the time him saying, you know, go right. right? Um, and I think what's been interesting about unpacking this and thinking about it is like 
again, no matter no matter we could point to the FBI and their lack of, of activity. We also could point to the FBI and I'm sure there was a lot of like foul stuff that they were saying each other said, right, to each other to drive that fissure between the relationship. Um for for black people, what what does it look like when because I've seen I, like very like celebrity couples will make a pact like okay look no matter what crazy shit people say we, it's here right it's here we're gonna figure it out first because people are just gonna try to say stuff to mess things up I wonder what that looks like for black people in the future in spaces of success because that that to me was done on purpose right so I mean so you you agree like what do you yeah what are your thoughts. Well, I think, um, especially we're talking about like black culture, right? There's always fractions, right? We've always been tribal, right? Between whether it's you know, <laughs> whether it's uh, whether it's like you know, whether being black American, Caribbean American, African, then the colorism of it, light skin, dark skin, brown skin, kind of thing. So, I think that that's always been a challenge. I think that's why we haven't been able to kind of pull ourselves up collectively um, compared to other communities, um, but. Uh, it, it's something to address, like, right? If they would, if, and then when you look at the documentary, uh, he was principled, right? And then mm-hmm. once he realized that uh, Elijah Muhammad was less principled than what people thought, he started to kind of pull away. Right. And he wanted to really represent the culture based off of the principles that he believed Elijah Muhammad was, was about, about was right? Styles, yeah. But at the same time, he was he was an influential person in our culture, right? So to talk against someone that has helped people, that changed people's lives, that still believe that they are that influential person, mm-hmm. you're taking someone's belief. And I think that's where the fraction, ha- and you see in the documentary, that's where mm-hmm. the fraction had happened. Like, hey, this is our this is this is our God, right? right? And you right. are destroying His image, therefore you are messing with us. And there mm-hmm. was a fraction there, so. I guess, and, and we have, we went through that historically, right? We think about, you know, Booker T. Washington and um, WBED boys, right? right they right. always argued, right? So it's like, I feel like now with our generation, it's like, okay, can we just, like you said, agree? Mm-hmm. Like, okay, you may go left, you may go right, but can we agree that we have to get to that next point right, without right. tearing each other down? Yeah. yeah. And I think that fraction and that division kind of is one of the reasons why that his mm-hmm. death was never, you know, finalized or investigated mm-hmm. how it should have been. Like you said, you know, we have Caribbean versus black colors and all that mm-hmm. type of stuff. And back then, it was just so interesting through the documentary. They were just like, basically, Elijah Muhammad was not to blame because no one would have moved against Malcolm mm-hmm. unless he said so. Right, right. But you do have these people who are more radicalized followers of Elijah Muhammad who may have just taken that step without him saying it, thinking they're doing, yeah, thinking they're doing, I don't, doing, buy, it. I don't but, buy it either. Uh, I, yeah, this I is just, you, I, that point I, is, yeah. like just thinking, fair, thinking, fair. I don't think that either. Like, yeah. We all know the FBI yeah. killed him. But um, just in terms of like the division, right. um, you know, once Malcolm X separated from Elijah Muhammad, um, kind of drove up, I guess, the radicalism of mm possibly some of his followers and that's all in my opinion the fbi needed to drive the narrative of your own people killed you um and we all now we all Mm -hmm. know or we um, most of us know that i don't think that that's true there that Mm -hmm. that played out to be true but just to create that division was all that Mm -hmm. you know the government needed to drive the narrative that your own people killed you and not us. Yeah. So. It's, yeah it's, it's, it's scary because you talk about like the public part of it, right? Where you have Malcolm going out and then now, you know, really poo-pooing on the name of Elijah Muhammad, which in, indirectly and directly actually poo-poos on then everybody who follows him. So it was a mis- miscalculation as to what was going to happen thereafter. And that's, but that's where it's like, I was watching it and I felt bad because I'm like, they, he just tried to bomb this dude's house with his kids yeah. and wife in it. Like, like I can't even blame him for coming out and being like, yo, has eight kids and eight different baby mamas. Like, I would, I forgot about doing the same thing. Like, yeah, like underage women and stuff. And there's like, but there, there's a there's a, a a strategy to how you go about doing that kind of stuff. And I and but I the empathetic side of me feels like look like if you try to bomb my home, I don't know how much tact I'm gonna have. In, in, you know, coothfully laying it down. Like, that's just not how I think about things. Right. Yeah. How do you strategically yeah. tell the truth? Right. 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 That's very true. And in a way that's, I guess, going to give you an image to the masses that you're not what they described him to be as right. this 
radical, egotistic man who doesn't know how to follow, you know, a religion when really he was telling the truth. Right. But so I, I said this is probably gonna be controversial in terms of like the thought, but just follow me. It's going to go off the track and come back. But like I was talking to my brother the other day and I was saying I was talking a lot about how a lot of conversations can be m- mellowed out by context or by giving pretext before you say it. Right. So with with Malcolm's situation, him being like if he got out in front of it, it was like, look, there's a lot of things that are going on that I don't agree with. Um, but, you know, make your own decision as a human being. But I'm going to have to step back. That's one way of prefacing getting in front of it. Right. But that that requires not your life being threatened and all that stuff. But I thought about this actually in the context of Bloomberg and the stop and frisk like all the energy around it right now because to me i i feel like there's a lack of we don't value ourselves enough as people as black people so when he comes out and he goes to a black church and they give him the podium the cameras and everything to say my bad after all these years yeah. i mean he really doesn't he's not sorry right. he's just that, to yeah that's that's our fault though for giving him that platform mm-hmm. like if he wants to come to my church sit in the back pew and watch what everyone else is watching you know what i'm saying but with that what i was saying if if i was like a communication strategist for bloomberg what i feel like is missed is this would have been a perfect opportunity for him to say, look, not do it at any black church. Just just do a talk, right? Hey, look, um, obviously, due to, due to his uh, systemic, historic approaches of how America has treated the black community, it has put the black community in a very unfortunate space, right? And as a result, it is... it. People that are in traumatic situations that are also economically distressed, that are also econom- economically disadvantaged, naturally crime is going to ha- happen in those areas more because of the fact that there's not means of basic survival. Mm-hmm. When that happens, as a person of power, I'm thinking in my mind, how do I, how do I clean up the city in terms of crime? And it's, it's I, where I missed, messed up is the fact that I didn't realize the damage of what my policies were doing to black families while I was just trying to blanketly erase the issue. So was I wrong in saying that you carbon copy your Xerox 18 to 25 year old black and Hispanic men? Absolutely. But now on the other side of it, I can say I, there was an improvement in crime in New York City, becoming the largest city with the lowest crime. And also I'm thoroughly sorry with how it affected indirectly, I didn't realize these families. If he said that, it's a lot of words, but I think people would have been like, okay, I could kind of get it. Doesn't mean it's yeah. right. Yeah. But I do feel like there is a there is a lack of communicative communicative skills nowadays. There's a lack of nuance. And there's a lack of, of understanding as a result. So everything is so hardcore. That's so funny that you said that because mm-hmm. that that specific marketing strategy would it would take a conscious marketer on his team to right. say that <laughs> and clearly yeah, he doesn't yeah. have it right. which Fact. speaks to his policies right 100% 100% so that was good though so, he should hire you, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like I'm not advocating okay. I'm not saying I believe I that not. that's the case <laughs> right. um, no, it was good. sorry for putting that information out for y'all <laughs> just thoughts but um but I want to this is a very this is a very hard transition but um you know, one thing that's been very intriguing to me over the last, I'd say, a few weeks has been watching, you know, Zaya, who who was Dwayne Wade's son. Mm-hmm. Now Zaya, his, you know, his daughter's trans. I mean, you, <laughs> you got judgment in your face. Okay. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, so bird's eye view, right? You zoom out. Um, there's been a political calculation in both Dwayne Wade's mind. Gabrielle Union, that's not technically his, his mother. Mm-hmm. So when I think about um, things from like a bird's eye view, like you back back track a little bit and just look at it. Um, it was a political calculus for like Dwayne Wade, Gabrielle Union to come out and be so supportive, right? Mm-hmm. The idea being that they wanted to show that a black family can be supportive of first, a, a gay child, secondly, and now, you know, a trans child, right? Um, in that calculation, you're going to open yourself up to to backlash, whatever that looks like. It could be positive support, it could be backlash, um, but that's the whole point, right? right. Um, did you guys see the, the boozy clip? I didn't. What, what were your initial takes on that? Okay, unfortunately, so I wanna hear your perspective on that. Um, I mean, on the surface level, I understand his point about kids are young and sometimes mm-hmm. they don't know themselves Mm -hmm. or they don't necessarily know what they want and their future likes they can't see the future um but 
so on the surface level, how you know, Boosie's not gonna phrase it properly. He's uh, okay. Boosie, okay. so yeah, yeah, he's yeah, not yeah. gonna phrase it properly. He's not gonna be politically correct. He's not gonna be anything like that. Mm -hmm. Do I think him saying it was him being malicious or trying to be offensive? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. I just think he's saying he's a young kid. Before you make any drastic changes, let's give him some time. Right. However, there are kids in America, all around the world, that know from a very young age, mm -hmm. in my opinion, who they are. Sure. And I think that Zaya is one of them. Mm -hmm. I think from an early age, he expressed that he doesn't identify with men. He identifies mm -hmm. with women and he considers himself a woman. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if you are over, if you're of age to be able to eloquently speak about it right. and passionately speak about it, then there's some truth behind it. Mm -hmm. You're not being influenced by society. You're not being influenced by like, when I heard him speak about it, when they were in, in the golf the cart, golf when he was yeah, with, yeah, yeah. when he was with D-Way, I was like, this boy is, well, sorry, this <laughs> Zaya is, is is right. It's, it's and that's why I said it's it's an adjustment right. thing, right. Um, especially for someone that young. Mm -hmm. But the way she let me be politically politically correct and how she would want to be represented, um, I think she knew what she was talking about. Mm -hmm. And I think someone who's that knowledgeable and can speak that passionately about who they are knows who they are. So my question to you guys would be: what what exactly? Because I think the crux of maybe that we should get to as to why people are upset is what, what exactly was Boozy referring to in the in the beginning of his statement, right? And what I mean by that is what it sounded like to me from what he said was the idea of getting surgery at right. 12 years old right. he felt was incorrect. Right. right, and that's what I'm saying. I, I don't but, think he was being – he wasn't politically in, yeah. incorrect, but again, this is Boozy. But no one mentioned <laughs> sex change – so surgery that, and that's what I'm saying where did all. that come from I, Why it just can't because okay. Boosie is Boosie and it can he's be just, assumed yeah. Right? yeah it can be assumed I mean we're talking about um, someone who's going from one sex to another so that definitely could be assumed however I don't think anyone mentioned it at all and that's what the, so I'm saying I don't so, think it can be assumed right I, only from the standpoint of like you can come out and say you're a trans woman and and either have never uh, no desire to you know have a gender Absolutely. you know assi reassignment Absolutely. or like just not, not yet. And right. so for me on face value, I didn't know if I missed something where now all of a sudden they were talking about helping him have a gender reassignment yeah, surgery at 12 years old. You kind of jumped the gun on that. And so if but it, so let's if, if hypothetically that's what happened, right? This was the conversation. Which I don't even think it's legal. I think it to be 18. Yeah. Um, and so like uh, hypothetically he's getting a gender reassignment at 12 years old. If you're, if, from a parent's point of view, if I'm, I'm looking at Boozy's statement, mm -hmm. you know, and I got into a real, like we got into a real conversation with me and my siblings, like we're in a group chat, like what do we all feel about this going back and forth? And I was like, you know, to be real, the first 40 ish seconds of it as a parent, I'm not a parent yet, but like I could get being like, yo, like just wait, like don't be, you know, and not, not all the stuff about like, you don't know, whatever, whatever, but I also know like, and this is not to trivialize it or, or minimize it, I should say. Like, I also know when I was like 14, 15 years old, like some of my friends had tats and I was like, oh, that's cool as shit. And like, if I would have gotten the tats that I thought were cool at 15, at 15, looking back at 18, I'd have been mad as hell. Like, why did I let somebody tap me for $20 and I don't like what's on my skin, right? And I can't afford to get a removal, right? And again, not to minimize the situation, it's just like, for me, just from a respect standpoint, from a parent's perspective, it's like, the, in my house, like the rule's 18, at 18, do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. like, like, cool. Mm -hmm. And it has nothing to do with you being a trans woman, it has nothing to do with anything other than the fact that this is my house, right? And sometimes as a kid, you know, I grew up, I didn't always like that explanation, but what I realized when it when it took some bearing out, some drawing out, my parents were willing to do that sometimes, right? But like, there are certain things too where also just that's just respect. Like I I can't, and it's just and sometimes it's just for patience, it's just for lessons in respect, all those things. But that's how I gathered it. The last twenty seconds goes off the rail a bit because then he's like, you know, don't be gay, let him be gay. <laughs> like it starts getting really boozy. I'm like, damn dog. I was like, I was following you, bro, but. But then it got a little got a little boozy. But um, but yeah, I mean, have you guys put any thought? And I don't know if you guys want to have kids in the future. What that looks like, but how you will handle? You know, first, well, first, what's been your thought on how Dwayne Wade's handled the situation as a father? Yeah, I I thought when I first saw the video, I saw when Dwayne Wade was they were in the car on the golf course, um, and I was like, wow, 
And then, uh, and so I Gabrielle's you. I follow her on Instagram. So she was like, "This is Zaya. Meet Zaya. She's passionate." I was like, "She." I was a bit confused, and I was reading. And I looked, and then I watched the video, and I was like, "Oh, okay." Um, but I, I think you know. Listen, this is new, right? When we think about like equal rights for, um, uh, I'm just gonna say, just the gay community, right? It started under the Obama administration. Sorry. It started under the Obama administration, right? So it's kind of new to embrace the, the different um, aspects of society for everyone, right? For monogamous um, couples, for straight, gay. And so it's like, and then now we, we're moving to a conversation of what does this look like amongst children, right? right? And then you have religion, you know, and that plays, you know, people, philosophies, their belief systems, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean... Um, it's a tough conversation. I mean, I have uh, gay people in my family. I have trans, I have that, mm -hmm. and we always knew he was gay at a young age, yeah, right? So yeah. it wasn't something that, and now that he's older, he identifies as a woman, and, and, and we we love him and respect yeah. him still. But I do, on the other hand, I do think that there is, um, uh, it is being promoted in a certain aspect, um, and I think uh, there's a, I think we have to balance it out between um, what is, what we should be accepting and what we're, over uh over advertising or marketing in a sense do you think that's targeted marketing like or absolutely in what way um i i think it's targeted in a sense that and that was a very loaded question i, yeah. I knew yeah so i'm sorry yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i think it's i think it's targeted in a sense um because if we and maybe we can we can talk about this more and get some more studies on it but i think that the the marketing of it is really being um targeted towards towards men and men of color mm. um, I mean if you think I, there was something on online I was watching they were saying like you think about how TV has changed over time there was always when you think about black men in TV there was a black man that was like we think about the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air mm -hmm. what was his best friend name from the Fresh uh, Prince of Jazzy Bel-Air Jazzy Jeff Jazzy, Jazzy Jeff, Jeff right? right you know you always had that friend and he said mm -hmm. as, as TV has modernized that friend, that type of friend, the fun friend, the cool friend, or the goofy friend, or not so smart friend. If you think about Martin, it was Cole, and right? Um, right? Mm -hmm. But and now it's the black gay friend, mm -hmm. right? So if you think about the roles in, in TV, you know the, the the characters within mainstream TV in terms of black men. What what is it now, mm -hmm. just consistently? Yeah. It's just an interesting observation. Yeah, and you're 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 in media, right? Like, um, so you see trends change you see you know you're you're behind the scenes in terms of even you know what is going to end up being displayed on camera right how how are are these conversations broached like what are you seeing what yeah like how, how are you feeling about that um i mean it's definitely it's definitely a conversation that's ha held within you know media planning um it's not at least in my experience, it's not so much to push the LGBTQ agenda, but it's to include it. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure, you know, that these campaigns or these brand activations are inclusive of that community. So, you know, they have options for, you know, uh, gender neutral bathrooms and, and just really content that's inclusive of, of all that, like right. staying away from like super hyper masculine content and, and things like that just to make sure you include that whole audience which means you get that revenue stream from that audience right. um so i definitely think that in in today's day and age as you said it's more prevalent um because it's more prevalent in our society but also it's a big revenue stream mm -hmm. like that uh, community, which I have many, many friends who are part of that, mm -hmm. realize that, mm -hmm. and they realize when they're being catered to or pushed um, mm -hmm. towards a certain product or a certain website or a certain social media outlet that is very cognizant of their community. Right. Um, but that just means one outlet is getting that money and that revenue stream versus the other. Right. right. Um, so I think that it's definitely more prevalent. And like you said, it's even in a lot of today's media that younger kids see. Mm -hmm. And I'm not necessarily against that. Um, I know, like, just for example, I mean, they have them um, in the Disney Channel series. They, like you said, the the new friend figure will be the gay best friend. I think even in, like, Arthur, they have, like, a new... Yeah, the Mr. Ratburn right. is gay. Um, is gay. Right. Um, so mm -hmm. while I'm not against that, I definitely think that 
when our parents, for an example, were our age, they weren't getting that, especially mm-hmm. in daytime TV or, right. um, you know, the Disney Channel, Nickelodeon, all those things that we would watch as kids. You know, that that content was gender roles personified, yeah, right, you know, right. like the stuff that they saw, the women were in the kitchen taking care of the kids, mm-hmm. the men were out working, you know, mm-hmm. da, 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 and there was almost no mention of the L- LGBTQ um, community. Right. Um, or and, and if it was, they were kind of like the, the outskirts, like mm-hmm. the freaks and the, mm-hmm. the, the people that were looked as the weirdos of society. Mm-hmm. When now it's more acceptable um, so because of that, I think they're trying to interject that more into, I guess, just today's day in life, which mm-hmm. includes, you know, content and TV directed towards younger people. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm not I'm I'm not against it at all, because hopefully when I have kids, you know, my kids, I'm going to love my kids regardless. Mm-hmm. So if I do have um, a child in that community, I would want them to see themselves being represented Mm -hmm. on TV um, and in social media and online. However, I don't want it to get to a point where we're pushing it on them. Mm -hmm. Um, And Mm -hmm. and almost like, if you don't have a a gay experience, then you're not living life or you're Mm -hmm. not, you know, like experiencing all there is to experience. Mm -hmm. And that could be troublesome. Yeah. Yeah. That that just that's just really what it is. Like I have I have no doubt. People in power make make really dark calls all the time on how things move. My my thing though, I th- I, I wonder. I think capitalism is probably more to blame in this scenario, kind of to, to your point, than anything. Simply because if you realize with the younger generation, they want to see more inclusivity, and one network's doing it and it's working for them, and kids are tweeting about it, and their best friends can see themselves represented on TV or what have you. I'm the other network over here. I'm like, oh, I got to do that too. And then right. now you're creating shows around the same. So I almost wonder if it's more ignorance tied to the dollar signs than it is like um, ignorance in the sense that it's not maliciously being done not ignorance in terms of what's going on. I think that's it. that's clear. But that I, I do I do wonder about that that kind of stuff a lot. Um but that's cool stuff. I want to transfer over to the next thing, but let's uh let's take a quick break. Okay. y'all appreciate you guys joining us i love thinking about the idea of being woke in action versus woke in action right so woke and doing stuff versus woke and not um so as we're thinking about the political climate that currently exists we're, we're now in the fourth year of trump um again i'm not passing judgment on it although i'm not a fan so I'm, i am passing judgment on it um you know we have a, there's a very wide and i don't know who you guys support i can go on a limb and assume it's not trump but i, I could be wrong right yeah. so like <laughs> This wide field of Democrats that started out being more diverse, um, now it's not. But at least it's, it, it, there are men and women on the stage. Um, wh- wh- where where are you guys right now in your thought process? Assuming, are you guys Trump fans? I mean, if you feel comfortable saying, are you Trump supporters? Are you not? Are you? Absolutely not. Okay. Right. Uh, well, I'm you like, don't got to feel boxy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's yeah. funny. Well, I'm I am I'm a registered Democrat. Uh, However, um, when that election uh, came up between when Bernie dropped out, right, uh, and it was just Hillary and Trump, I was willing to vote for Trump. Mm. It was it wasn't until um, because it was just for me, Hillary was just more of the same. It wasn't until on one of the debates, Trump said, Universal stop and frisk that just scared the shit out of me. (laughs) Right. And I was like, "Okay, no. (laughs) Um, But for me, when I just look at the policy of it, you know, the the policies that he was in. not all of the policies, but the economic policy in terms of how to move America forward. Mm -hmm. In terms of how to move America forward, I thought that that was the most, it was one of the most innovative plans that I've seen economically. Mm -hmm. And I see black people, um, people of color and black people um, can really take a position in in that plan. So, So my question to that would be like, when I think about the EPA, right, Environmental Protection Agency, um, and the, the, 
the lax policy. So actually cutting a lot of the policies that Obama's administration put into place, um, things to ensure that the environment's still here. Simply for, you know, you look across the industries and you see his friends, his buddies, this is Trump I'm talking about, are CEOs of many of these companies that now will win massively because they're no longer being regulated at the same pace. What are your, and that's good economically. What are your thoughts, though, in terms of, like, it, like what are your thoughts on how that's, that, that happens? Yeah, well I, I, well, I think it's, well, that part is horrible in a sense, like, you know, them not being, you know, conscious of the environment. I don't necessarily agree with that, but I do think that they're, you know, that's a federal level, right? I think there's there's a lot that can be done. It's not perfect. Um, I don't think we should put uh, capitalism above um, our quality of life, our ecosystem. Um, so there's definitely should be some pushback around that. But I think, you know, there's a spectrum, right? There's like extreme, there's like the middle being centralized, and there's just like this liberal space, right? right. So it's like, how can we create this balance? Like, okay, what is the outcome of the goal? Is because you want to deregulate because government has so much red tape and things need to go faster because we're behind globally, mm -hmm. right? So, okay, fine, I understand that, but not at the cost of our environment. So mm -hmm. how do we create that win-win? Yeah. I, I would, I would, one, one thing I'd say, certainly some of the, the red tape does make it hard to be innovative. But I'd argue capitalism or the system, the money that's in politics actually does more to debilitate the system than the, the regulation that that holds things. With. It's all tied together. Yeah. Like, right? Like, at the end of the day, when you have these, like, I, even learning more about the Koch brothers and the money they have tied in, like, cars, mm -hmm. the steel industry and cars, and learning that, like, all these different cities, and shout out to Netflix and Vox for dropping all these documentaries out now nowadays. But they they have all and uh, and Hassan Minaj, maybe that's where I got this from. But like that, they're putting so much policy around, or writing in policy and giving it to politicians who are then running on these different platforms and then putting it into action around more highways and less public um, public transportation. Reason being is that if you have more highways, you want to help people get more cars on the road because you're making money through the steel industry. It, it serves you nothing to have people on trains every day. Like, that's not adding to your pockets. And it's like, to me, it's like, I would have never even thought of that. Like, I, I would have never thought, why are New York City subways so shitty? Well, maybe there's a, a push deeply to actually get people more in cars coming in from Jersey, Connecticut, whatever. I don't, I, that, that to me is so sinister. And it's just so deep. And it's just like, it comes down to the green and, that's my, my, my issue is that I, I can't stand giving these politicians credit for things when their their ignorance isn't ignorance. They're very aware, right? Like they're like Trump to me deregulates because I want my friends to live fat and happy and God forbid anything happens to me, they have the means to also support me, whatever that looks like, right? Um and so that's that's my concern is intentions do matter. Um and I feel like with Trump the intentionality behind a lot of the moves he makes are to enrich himself and his friends. And I've been really critical of the media um, because I hate that they try to cover this as if it's normal. Yeah. What we're seeing is not like commuting sentences and pardoning people that are known bad actors. It sends such a horrible message to the society. Um, it, it, it validates if you're rich, if you're white, you can get away with whatever. It reinforces the people of color that you will always be second class in this country. And the media gets on stage and, on stage and, and they go, um, oh, you can't say that. I mean, we don't know if he really meant that. Mm -hmm. And it's like, bruh, what's this? Come on, what, are, what are we really talking about? Um, it's interesting yeah. what you shared because you, you talked about the policies and we talked about capitalism. But, you know, what you just described is that um, and, and Dr. Claude Anderson, he talks about this, right? You buy your politicians, right? Your mm -hmm. politicians, if, you know, if I'm, it costs money to win an election, yeah, you know, thousands and millions yeah. of dollars. So I'm going to speak to the interests of my constituents, right? Yeah. I want to get in office. So, and that, that goes back to, um, you know, civic engagement amongst uh, communities of color, right? Mm -hmm. If you are organizing, you are not only voting, but also putting your dollar behind that politician then that politician has a vested interest in to advocate for right. your behalf mm -hmm. so i think sometimes in in communities of color we, we get we get upset about those things but mm -hmm. he's doing what politicians do right. now mm -hmm. we can look at ourselves and communities okay who are you supporting who, what right. do, where are your dollars going politically and are they or are they not advocating for your policy right. are right. we having that conversation yeah mm -hmm. and i think that's kind of why we saw 
the fall of the candidates that looked like us for Mm -hmm. one and that mostly represented what we want and need as a community and like you said we buy our politicians i mean um Kamala Harris, Cory Booker, the main thing with them dropping out was the the financial aspect behind it. And you think about it, you know, these are two people in our culture and our society who to us are relatively wealthy, but then you put them up against a Trump or a Bloomberg. 400 million in And there's honestly no competition. And so it goes back to exactly what you said. Not only do we have to support them with our votes, but we have to be able to put collectively as a community put a financial a sub, substan- substantial mm-hmm. financial promise almost behind these candidate behind these candidates to allow them to be successful and we just didn't do that this time and we're left to with who we are left with mm-hmm. and i can't i hate the way the system is we all do mm-hmm. but like you said it candidates are bought so at the end of the day, Kamala or Corey, they could have been the perfect candidate, but without that financial backing, they're no longer candidates. And, and I'd argue too, like, I'll be real, like neither of them were Obama, right? And I, I feel the the thing is to me, the re, uh, that's actually like a sad statement. Like for black people, we've always been, it's exceptionalism. You must, like, you can't bump into an Obama if you try the rest of your life. If you know, there will be other amazing people we'll meet. There'll be other amazing leaders and stuff. But I'm saying like that's a very special person, very special special family. And like if the mandate now, because the first black president, I'll say that they allowed to be president. If the first black president it is was that, and we're waiting for the next that, like that that. That's such a disservice to black people because the reality is like there's other amazing black people that don't need to be a uh, Obama in terms of just transformative it, like but that's interesting to me um i I will say I mean looking at the how things are are breaking out now you have Bloomberg now in the race you have Bloomberg put up four hundred million so far in TV ads it's gotten him like second and third place on many polls um uh, somebody had posted out that if you were a New Yorker you had five hundred dollars in your account and you spent two seventy five to get on the train. Um, you still would have you would have spent more on your of your net worth than Bloomberg has spent on four hundred million dollars worth of campaigns. He's worth sixty billion dollars. Um, so that puts things in, in perspective. This is pennies. This, this, this is fun. It's just just throwing shit on the table. You know what I mean? Um, and it's gotten him in third place on many polls. Um, certainly during the most recent debate, finally he stepped into the to the ring, if you will, and you had Elizabeth Warren. Warren, yeah. Mind you, like I'm, I'm not decided yet, but I will say I'm big. I'm my biggest, like the person I'm biggest on right now is Elizabeth Warren. Um, policy wise, I think she's far like ahead of everybody else. But also too, like she'll bust you down, like yeah. you know what I mean. And I, I really dig that. Um, what are your guys' thoughts on like, the actual field left, like Klobuchar, Warren, um, Biden? Mm-hmm. Are you guys leaning anywhere yet? Are you reserving thought? Do you are you not going to vote? Like, what's your thoughts? Um, it was hard because again, you know, Corey was never a main contender, but Kamala was. Mm-hmm. So, I think on the debate stage, if there's anyone who could handle Trump's ignorance, it was her, mm-hmm. and who could really like slay him with there. the sass, but also with the intelligence. I thought it was her. Uh, but yesterday. Elizabeth Warren came with it. Um, I don't know if you guys saw, they put like the ether beat behind (laughs) when she was going in. uh, The build up was so epic. It was so epic. And I think that we just talk about media, social media within the election. um, Even that tweet, shout out to whoever originated, where that tweet originated from. But even that tweet, got so much traction and put Elizabeth Warren in the minds of so many people, especially in our community. As it should that have, because she was once, falling for no reason. Right, me, that, that one, she was never there before. Mm-hmm. And it's as simple as putting the That's ether so beat behind her, which is, yes. which is fine to me because she, she right now she's my, my top candidate. But just to see that tweet go viral... Mm-hmm. And now there's so many people who, if they didn't know who she was, now they know who she is. Mm -hmm. And if they never heard her speak with that amount of passion and drive, now they have. So now they're on, you know, they're on her, they're on everybody's, she's on everybody's radar. 
So, um, just in the current state, she's, um, I haven't decided yet, as you said, but she's definitely one of my top contenders. Um, I love her policies. Um, and I love that she's a woman. And I think with the whole, uh, Hillary, I went, while she was running, everybody knows we love the Clintons, but the Clintons had some stuff with them. Mm -hmm. Um, but with Elizabeth Warren, you know, no one's hands are a hundred percent clean. She has some did slight, we, did we love the Clintons or did, did people like Bill Clinton, even though they had their hands dirty? Right. Or, or I mean, whatever that means. Huh? I mean, <laughs> In my opinion, my that, that, <laughs> right. In my I'm opinion, that election, <laughs> yeah, you gotta watch it. I mean, I'm that election was the lesser of two evils because, uh, my father is Haitian. Mm. So if you know anything about the background with Hillary and what she did to the ha Haitian community, that wasn't cool. Mm. Uh, she took a lot of money, did a lot of damage to Haiti. So it, to me was the lesser of two evils, mm. um, with that election. But with this one, you know, Elizabeth Warren is not 100% clean, as as you would say, but I feel like just as a candidate, her record is decently solid. Um, her po I love her policies. Mm -hmm. And now, thanks to, thanks to yesterday, we see that she can handle herself on the debate stage mm -hmm. and really call out, you know, the wrongdoings of all these candidates without being catty or without being bitchy or whatever people associate with women with. Right, right. Um, and that was a big thing for me, the way Kamala used to come with it. But, mm -hmm. you know, she was sassy, but she was intelligent. Mm -hmm. She really got to the point. She knew her policies. She mm -hmm. knew her numbers. She knew her statistics. Um, and I knew Elizabeth Warren had it in her, but I was scared that she would never bring that to the forefront mm -hmm. just for the fear of being looked at as, like, a catty woman. Well, but yesterday... Yeah. She really came with it, should, yeah. and it was, it was awesome. you know she really, really uh, did a lot for her campaign, mm -hmm. um, and she did it in a very classy way. Where you know she's not a doormat anymore; people can't walk over her. I, I do. So I love, I love mm -hmm. that about it. And I think it's a, it's tough for women. A lot of times, you guys find yourself between a rock and a hard place, right? Because because Elizabeth Warren to me, because she's a white woman, she can come off then sounding whiny if she's too too pointed with her complaints, right? Mm -hmm. Which are all justifiable complaints. Because mm -hmm. Kamala, she comes off of being too angry, too right. sassy, right. if you will, right? Exactly. Because she's a black woman that's just coming at it with real stuff. Right. And so it's like there's anywhere you run, there's a problem. You know, it's, if it's Hillary and you, you faint, it's the end of your campaign. If it's Bernie Sanders, they have a heart attack, and it's like, keep on championing Bernie, <laughs> even though you're 9,000 years old, right? I love Bernie, by the way, but I'm not, you know, like, whatever. Um, but like, yeah, I mean, that's such an interesting thing for for you. What what are your thoughts on it so far? Um, I'm I'm sitting back for now, okay. uh, because for me, uh, you know, I was with with when Obama won. Like that was our, our highlight, right? Mm -hmm. We were so excited, um, and you know, as we got on, I got I became more conscious about um, policies and legislation, right. right? And what what elected officials represent in terms of uh, their agenda. Um, their political agenda and, and what that legislation, those policies would look like in real time in the market. So for me, it's just like, okay, we have some time just to see, um, you know, who's going to win and, and who's going to represent those policies that's going to push us forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so do you anticipate things getting like uh, darker, like more cattier between the candidates as the. <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah. I just feel like I agree. I mean, Someone? we have no. It is. It is. I mean, look at our president now. He's right. a damn reality star. star, right? But um, I definitely could see it getting a little uglier. But what I wish is that people, especially with Elizabeth Warren and and Kobachar and and them, um, the women specifically, it was my fear that they wouldn't go as hard as and direct as the men would, like mm -hmm. you said, right. because we're always stuck between a rock and a hard place. If you're right. a black woman, you're too sassy. Mm -hmm. It's got too much attitude, too angry. If you're a white woman, you don't want to be whiny. You don't mm -hmm. want to take on the problems or speak about the problems that um, people who don't like you face. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, we have zero black candidates running, right? Mm -hmm. Period. So um, I'm sitting back also, but in, in kind of like... My, my peripheral, I'm keeping Elizabeth Warren there just because I really feel like her policies um, align with a majority of groups. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I hope that she keeps coming with it. Yeah. I don't want her to get caught in the spot um, where I thought she was, except for mm-hmm. yesterday, of mm-hmm. just, you know, trying to stay below the radar, stay, you know, mm-hmm. stay strong, stay intelligent, stay, um, you know, educated, but not coming with it because you don't want to be looked at. Like not challenging Bernie right. into that whole exactly. situation where he um, said, I didn't think a woman could win. Exactly. Um, so now that she's starting yeah. to challenge Bernie and calling out Michael Bloomberg yeah. and I can't wait to see what she has for Trump. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, I am a little worried. I, I think, I don't think Trump re like winning again is, is, is out of the scope of reality. I don't want, I wish I didn't have to say that, but I will say the, the one problem I find with, as a human being and as a citizen of the U.S., I feel like, yes, you want to have as many candidates as you can to choose who you want to then follow. What we know about human beings is that's just not reality of what, what works. You walk into a restaurant, I think Cheesecake Factory, there's like 9,000 pages you're flipping through. Mm-hmm. Choice paralysis kicks in. You're like, ah, that, not that. You know what I mean? Like, whereas like some restaurants, it's like eight choices and everything's good. Yeah. Um, I think you got a thought, but let me, I'm just going to get this out real quick. So like, with that being the case, I wonder if, each candidate on the Democratic side is different enough, right? Where you have the E. Warren crew, you have the uh, the Bernie Sanders crew, you have the Pete Buttigieg crew, you got the Klobuchar. They're different enough where people go, okay, if if Klobuchar wins, I don't really like her like that. I don't know. I'm not excited anymore. If Bernie wins, well, I was hoping E. Warren would take it. I'm not as excited. And I wonder if, like, because it's such a wide field that there's a higher likelihood that that happens, which then, of course, is to the benefit of Trump at the end of it. I mean, do y'all think that's even a reality that that could happen? Um, Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, we talk about, you're talking about the Democratic Party, right, as a whole. So there's a lot of divide and conquer within that. And like Mm -hmm. what you just shared it perfectly, right? Mm -hmm. If my candidate doesn't win, uh, I'm, you know, I lost, you know, I've kind of lost that momentum, Mm -hmm. that belief, you know, that hope, you know, I might not vote at all, right? right? Because I was so gun hold on this person where as opposed to the other side, the Republican side, they're they're clear. There's no there you know, there's no fractions within that establishment in the sense that's gonna sway They wouldn't even bring witnesses (laughs) up. They have they are not moving. (laughs) And I think the other thing well well so and I'll say this because I've been very vocal about it uh you know in, in, in my community is that I was just really alarmed at the fact of how much of the black population has been going behind Trump. Like, listen, I mean, I'm sorry, around Bloomberg. I'm a native New Yorker, right? Mm-hmm. Born and raised. I mean, let's be clear. We like, are we not? Why are we not addressing the fact that we're fighting gentrification and displacement because of the policies under Bloomberg? I mean, what have what has Bloomberg? Uh, strategically done for people of color in New York City. I don't think people, now it depends on where you're coming from. If you're, if you're a native New Yorker or did you just move here five, ten years ago, but like, how can we take this platform nationwide to say that this is perfect for people of color? Stop and frisk is another thing. I'm not even, we're, we all know that. I'm not even going to get into that, but Bloomberg, he has a Bloomberg a foundation. Like, can we talk about what, what resources has been in the community to propel him to this level outside of politics and money? And then the other thing I would say is that um, he, what, it's just, it's just interesting. So a lot of the argument was like, okay, well, we just need anyone to beat Trump. I think that is alarming language to say, like, can we, I agree. Okay. They're fine. I'm, I'm with it, but can we be strategic and about who we place, like not just say we want to take anything because we have to get rid of this man, yeah. because let's let's look at what's your what's what can possibly happen by by making that position, right? Mm-hmm. Like, can we just talk about it in real time and not just say, well, just anything but him? Like, mm-hmm. okay, fine, we can consider you, but let's put some things in place that will help us be successful, right? right. Displacement is is huge amongst mm-hmm. you know you know, and then it, another thing about it is that when you talk about affordable housing, like we didn't even look at the fact that. That after that administration, a lot of people from the Bloomberg administration went into um, housing, um, the shelters, like the the uh, the um, hotels are now mixed use shelters. Mm-hmm. I mean, right. it's big right. money. Like the developers mm-hmm. are the in the sh- hotels, and right? Shelter things. hotels. Mm-hmm. I mean, so are we going to take that same model and make it nationwide? Yeah. But we, you know what I think is missed a lot of times in the conversation around Trump and his role and all this is. This really is not about Trump, right? This is this to me is about that last grab of white male power. Mm-hmm. 
when if if Hillary was to win in 2016 after a black president, mm -hmm. like what's next, right? Like mm -hmm. Pete Buttigieg, like that's people's right. thought process. Like right. it's only going to get more and more liberal, right. and and the the country literally has more liberal thinking people than than conservative thinking people. That's a fact, right? She won by three million votes. Gerrymandering doesn't happen because things might just happen in the election. It happens because now nah, we got to make sure this shit is leaning in our favor, right. right? So when I see Trump and why and why it's such allegiance in following him and fo following in line is because they don't care who the who the messenger is, who the person is, as long as they're in office, because that allows for them to put judges in place. Right, whether it's at the circuit level, whether that's at the, the Supreme Court level, it allows for them to put policies in place. Trump doesn't know he he just he just signs his name and passes it forward, right? He, you know what I mean? He's a puppet, and and he, what he doesn't realize, I think, is he's the biggest joke in all this for, in his own life, right? Like he actually is a puppet, in which he doesn't realize. Whatever it doesn't actually matter because the 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 Republicans are getting all the things that they desire out of him being in office, and so I think that that doesn't get enough energy, like. There were a lot of people extremely angry when Obama won the second term election mm -hmm. because they thought it was an aberration. Then when it happened again, it was like, huh? Mm -hmm. What? And then you try, you do everything in your power, not only to thwart him and his power, which we saw with a lot of the stuff, him putting up a judge, they're not even looking at him, all the way through to now, you, Hillary, it was, it, there's a lot of things that are problems, and I think uh, looking at even the Democratic Party and what happened with um, was it Debbie Washington Schultz and that email that was talking about Bernie Sanders, they were really trying to make sure he didn't win. Mm -hmm. And it's like there's so much corruption around everywhere when it comes to this stuff that, you know, I, I look in disbelief at what I'm seeing on TV reflected back to me. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, like this is this is what we've signed up for as acceptable. This is this is cool. It's just it's a hard it's a rock and a hard place, as you said, and, and and it's kind of, I think at this point we have to collectively, you know, just things like this start the conversation on a candidate that's best for us, and not like you said, who can just beat Trump. And I feel like a lot of the support comes, for from, of our community for Bloomberg comes from, they know he got the money, yeah. and they know he's not a woman. So therefore, he could beat Trump. Yeah. And I think that's where a lot of it comes from. And that's unfortunate because people don't dive into the horrible things that he's done to our community, but they just see Trump as this devil who, by any means necessary, we need to be mm -hmm. not really looking at. And that's what I, what I would hate for it to come down to because the last election I almost didn't vote because it was the lesser of two evils. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I still ended up, I still ended up voting, but... That's what I don't want it to come down to for this mm -hmm. election, the lesser of two evils, um, which I hope it won't. I feel like it's definitely still a possibility. Mm -hmm. um, but I think now it's just really pushing the conversation of someone, of supporting someone who's good for our community, whether they're a woman or a man, whether they have the dollar sign behind them or not, because our community we run shit yeah, like yeah. if we really got together and the force behind us is so strong we just don't utilize it and we don't it's unstoppable and we don't come together like how we should but if we did whatever candidate we wanted to be elected would yeah. be elected yeah. but because you have that fear I guess of Trump being elected to again, not just our communities, like black and brown communities. So, you know, Latinos, um, mm -hmm. immigrants, all that type of stuff, all those type of people. Um, it just comes down to really driving the conversation and, and really identifying why Bloomberg can win against Trump. Yes. But why he shouldn't be our candidate because he's just no good in my opinion. I think he can beat Trump, but I think Elizabeth Warren, if we really, or whoever, if we got behind one mm -hmm. candidate, I mean, everyone has the, their shit with them, so mm -hmm. to speak. Biden, definitely. Yeah. Um, but I just feel like the one thing people know about Bloomberg is that he's an old, semi-conservative, old white man. He's a Republican. Right, right. And he's a, uh, is he still and independent? The, right. No, he's is, a Democrat now. Yeah, okay. now, yeah. now. <laughs> Um, but you know, the thing, especially in our community, we're just not knowledgeable about certain things that in his past and by Elizabeth Warren, all these other candidates 
now that he's made it to you know the debate stage, they're finally calling him out on it. Mm-hmm. And I think that that knowledge wasn't necessarily there before mm-hmm. until he got to that level where they're like, all right, you're here playing with the big dog. Now we about to call you on your shit yeah. because it's some stuff there. Yeah. It's not just Biden who got some stuff with him. Yeah. It's you too. And yeah. here, let's call you out on this um, to kind of shake up that whole narrative of he's okay. He got mm-hmm. the money and he could get those independent liberal, but conservative votes yeah. that let's say a, a would it wouldn't, would, get. wouldn't be able to get. So, and, and you know, as you're talking, what I was thinking about a lot was, I think if we're being really hypercritical about like self-reflection, like it's not really y'all that ha- that need that lecture. It's black men, right? Because the reality is, black women like the same. Way, black women aren't voting for weren't out there voting for Trump in mass, right? Like that was a very low percentage. It was actually a high percentage of black men comparatively to what you would think would be right. out there. And I look at Bloomberg. I think too. I, and I think this is more labeling. I'm gonna label it more on the tr- trauma of the black community and being economically disenfranchised for a long time. There is a reverence he put behind people who have money. And when Bloomberg, when you say sixty billion next to his name, yeah. I don't care what he did, I respect him. Right. That's just the mentality. Yeah. It's and like so, the name Bloomberg Bloomberg yeah. equals dollar signs. Right. And well, we they just, think that that could that could win yeah. against Trump. And it speaks to our community. We we like being bought. We can right. be bought. Right. Which is unfortunate. It's so unfortunate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So really sad note, y'all, but hopefully <laughs> things pick up. Um, I want to speak and appreciate Latoya Benjamin. Thank you for joining us. Sydney Michelle Duyan, thank you for joining thank us. You for where can people find you guys as we wrap up here? I'll let you go first. Uh, uh, people can find me. I have a website, uh, www.latoyabenjamin.org. Um, you can find me social medias, all the social medias, uh, Sid Mitch, S-I-D-M-I-C-H underscore, and Sydney Michelle on YouTube. Dope, dope, dope. Thank you guys for joining us. Again, that's another edition of the WYL Take Ownership Podcast, where we're all about taking ownership of your mental, your economics, and your community. Take care, y'all. Peace.